Welcome everyone to our video on Vesper theory and molecular geometry. In this video, we are going to introduce what Vesper theory is and how it works. And we're going to apply it to describe the shapes of molecules and show how we represent those molecules on paper using shape diagrams. Let's begin with the definition. Valent shell electron pair repulsion theory, Vesper theory, states that the electrons around a central atom of a molecule will arrange themselves in three dimensions in order to minimize the repulsion between their valence electrons. So this is a theory of bonding, which take, tries to account for the observed shapes of molecules, and also to apply this theory to predict the shapes of different combinations in, uh, of, uh, of atoms. Vesper theory depends on the electrons around the central atom. Those are the valence check electrons that matter. And when we have a molecule, there are two types of uh, valence electrons on that central atom. We have electrons that are bonded to other atoms. So we're gonna look at the number of atoms bonded to the central atom. But we may also have lone pairs of electrons around the central atoms, electrons in the valence shell, which are unbonded. We group these pairs of electrons into two, these two different categories because they cause differing amounts of repulsion. Because the bonded pair are attracted to two nuclei, they're fixed in place much more tightly and into a smaller region whereas the lone pairs of electrons are able to spread out and the orbital of which they occupy is occupying much more space. As a result, lone pairs cause the most amount of repulsion. So if we have two lone pairs of electrons, they are going to repel each other much more than two bonded pairs. And a lone pair bonded pair will be somewhere in the middle. As we look at these different shapes, we'll see that it's often the case that the lone pairs arrange themselves on opposite sides of the molecule. Uh, so in order to minimize their repulsion, because that repulsion, repulsive force is much greater than that between the bonded pairs. For the rest of this video, I'm going to be going through all of the shapes that we will be learning in this course. Probably the most effective way for you to follow along is with the chart that I've already provided, which contains all the shapes. And you can match what you have on paper to what I'm showing on the screen. I think you would also get a lot of value out of using the Molecular Shapes Interactive from FET. I have the direct uh, link here on the screen, but if you just search Molecular Shapes and FET, P-H-E-T, in Google, you can pull that interactive up uh, very easily. And it's excellent for moving the shapes around and seeing them in three dimensions much more clearly than I can show you on paper or on the screen. Before getting into the shapes, I just wanna mention that every shape that we are considering are simple shapes with one central atom and then one or more terminal atoms around that central atom. Obviously, there are more complex shapes, but when we talk about the shapes of molecules, we are always just considering one central atom at a time. And as a result, more complex shapes are just a combination of many simple shapes put together. The first molecular shape we're going to look at is a linear shape where there are two atoms bonded to the central atom and there aren't any lone pairs on that central atom. Here are two examples. Beryllium dihydride and carbon dioxide both have a linear shape. Note that the presence of a double bond in the carbon dioxide does not impact the shape as well. Carbon is bonded to two different atoms and there are no lone pairs on the central atom. As a result, they take on the same shape. Because that second bond is a pi bond and runs parallel to the sigma bond, a double or triple bond will never impact the shape. So we don't count those as extra electrons from a Vesper point of view. 
Molecules are often represented using ball and stick diagrams as well. So I just thought I'd show some of these as well. So this is a bit more of a three-dimensional perspective, but here's carbon dioxide uh, there using a ball and stick diagram. The angle around the central atom in both of these molecules is 180 degrees. Let's add another atom bonded to the central atom. So now we have three atoms bonded and no lone pairs. This forms a trigonal planar shape. An example of this would be aluminum trihydride, something that we've seen with Lewis diagrams is a molecule which forms, which is octet deficient, but aluminum has no lone pairs on the central atom and is bonded to three different atoms. This molecule is flat and forms a triangle between the three hydrogens or the three terminal atoms. Here, is a, here it is on a slightly uh, different angle. So you can kind of see that it lies in a flat plane and those three terminal atoms each are 120 degrees apart from each other. We are going to continue with an example where there are three pairs of electrons around the central atom. But in this case, the central atom is only bonded to two and there is one lone pair. In this case, we take on a bent shape. An example would be SO2. So once again, oxygens are bonded to the sulfur be with double bonds, but those double bonds don't uh, count as two pairs of electrons for Vesper theory. Each of those would only count as one pair. Here we have the ball and stick diagram. The angles between the two oxygens at the bottom of this molecule are going to be close to 120 degrees, but slightly less. Slightly less because of that lone pair that's sitting in my diagram at the top of the molecule because lone pairs exert more repulsion, that pushes the two oxygens a little bit closer together. That's decreasing the angle between them. So it's close to 120, but not quite. Now that we have a diagram with a lone pair here, I also just want to mention that oftentimes in shape diagrams, we don't show the lone pairs. We want to, shape diagrams are meant to represent the shape as accurately as possible. We don't need to show lone pairs of electrons. That being said, in all of the diagrams that I'm going to show you today, I will continue showing the lone pairs on the central atom because I think it's helpful to visualize how they are impacting the shape of the molecule. Our next shape is a tetrahedral shape where there are four atoms bonded to the central atom and that central atom has no lone pairs. Methane, CH4, is common example of this molecule. Here's the ball and stick diagram. And on a slightly different angle, but I hope you can appreciate here is that these four hydrogens or the four terminal atoms in a tetrahedral molecule are equally spaced apart in three dimensions. So even though on paper, it looks as if some of the terminal atoms are closer to each other than the others, all four of those hydrogens are 109 degrees apart from each other. For shapes that require us to represent three dimensions on paper using a shape diagram, we use wedges and dashed lines to represent a bond that's coming out of the paper or out of the plane towards us or back into the plane. So this wedge on the left-hand side here, that's representing the hydrogen coming towards us. The dashed line triangle that we see on, uh, at the back here, that is a hydrogen that is going into the plane behind the other carbon, similar to what we see on the left-hand side here. Let's now switch one of those bonded pairs and make it a lone pair. So now there are only three atoms bonded to the central atom and we have one lone pair. The shape that results here is called a trigonal pyramidal. Here's the shape for the ammonia molecule, NH3. And if you compare that to the tetrahedral, you'll see that those four pairs of electrons are still spaced out in the same orientation as the tetrahedral molecule, 
But in this case here, one of them is a lone pair. The angles between the hydrogens are slightly less than 109 degrees. Once again, because the lone pair that I've drawn at the top here is pushing down on those bonds and pushing them a little bit closer together. Here is the NH3 molecule represented with a ball and stick diagram as well. The final shape that results when there are four pairs of electrons around the central atom is the bent shape. We're familiar with the shape from the water molecule. Around the oxygen, there are two bonded pairs and two lone pairs of electrons. So it turns out those four pairs of electrons are still arranging themselves in the same orientation as those previous two molecules we've looked at, tetrahedral and trigonal bipyramidal. But the shape of the actual molecule between the oxygen and the two hydrogens just takes on a bent shape. The bond angle between those hydrogens decreases even further to much less than 109 degrees. For example, for water, it's around 104.5 degrees. Once again, there's our ball and stick diagram there. Let's now move to atoms that have an expanded octet. So either five pairs of electrons around the central atom or six pairs of ele electrons around the central atom. Our first shape here is the trigonal bipyramidal shape. This molecule here has two regions that we want to think of. We have these three chlorines that form a trigonal planar shape. So if we think of those in, as a triangle in the plane, and then perpendicular to that plane, we have a chlorine sticking up and a chlorine sticking down. So we have the planar atoms, and then we call these ones above and below the axial atoms. So two distinct regions here. Within the three chlorines in the plane, it's 120 degrees, just like with the trigonal planar molecule. Between the axial chlorines and the chlorines in the plane, it's 90 degrees. Once again, here's a ball and stick diagram of this molecule on a slightly different angle to hopefully help you appreciate this shape of the molecule. And once again, as we get into these more complex shapes, the simulation is really valuable for you to be able to rotate this molecule around and have a good appreciation for its actual three-dimensional shape. Let's now go through the process of taking away one bonded pair and making that a lone pair. If there are five pairs of electrons around the central atom, the molecule takes on what's called a seesaw shape. The lone pair will be one of the three pairs of electrons that are in the plane and the axial atoms remain. The angles here, as always, have decreased slightly because this lone pair is pushing all of those atoms to the left. So as a result, the angle between the axial fluorines and the ones in the plane will be slightly less than 90 degrees. And the angles between the two fluorines on the left-hand side here in the plane will be slightly less than 120 degrees. Sulfur tetrafluoride is an example of this molecule. And here we see it in a three-dimensional ball and stick diagram. If we replace another bonded pair with a lone pair, we now have three bonded pairs of electrons, or the central atom is bonded to three different atoms. And we have two lone pairs. This molecule looks like a T. The angles between the fluorines are slightly less than 90 degrees because those lone pairs are pushing those bonded pairs a bit to the right, but it's pretty close to 90 degrees. And once again, there is our ball and stick diagram for this molecule. So we have a T-shaped molecule. And finally, if we have two bonded pairs and three lone pairs, we end up getting a linear shape as well. The lone pairs occupy the three, uh, three locations in the plane and only the two axial atoms remain. The triiodide ion is an example of this, uh, this shape here. Now let's move on to when there are six pairs of electrons around the central atom. If there are six pairs and no lone pairs, it is going to be an octahedral shape. For this shape here, 
every ax or every terminal atom is at equal distance from all of the other ones that surround it. So all of the angles here are in 90 degrees. It's a symmetrical shape. If there are five atoms bonded to the central atom and one lone pair, there are still six pairs of electrons around the central atom. But the shape now that this atom, uh, this molecule takes on is a square-based pyramid. Here I've drawn the lone pair at the bottom, but once again, it doesn't matter which fluorine or which bonded pair has been removed and where you put it. It's just this is the way that this shape is typically represented. So we have the four fluorines which sit as a square on the base of the pyramid. And then we have one fluorine that's sticking up and that form uh, forms the top of the pyramid uh, there. The angles between these fluorines are going to be now be slightly less than 90 degrees. As always, it's a result of this lone pair. In this case, the way I've drawn it, the lone pair is causing more repulsion and pushing up on those fluorines, decreasing the angle between all of them slightly. And once again, here is the ball and stick diagram for this molecule. And finally, we have the square planar shape where we have four bonded pairs and two lone pairs. In this case here, the two lone pairs occupy opposite sides of that octahedral shape. Why? Because lone pairs cause the most repulsion. So in order to minimize repulsion, those lone pairs are, uh, those lone pairs are positioned to maximize their distance between each other. The xenon tetrafluoride molecule is an example of a square planar molecule. And in this molecule here, because we have a lone pair pushing down, repelling those fluorines, and we have one pushing up, repelling the bonded, uh, bonded electrons as well, the angles in this molecule end up being 90 degrees because those, the repulsion above and below cancel each other out. So this is the last molecule that we will consider. Depending on which chart you're looking at, you may see that there are some other theoretical shapes that are listed if we continue replacing bonded pairs with lone pairs. I'm going to leave them out for this video because there aren't any common molecules that we come across with those shapes. If those molecules exist, which in all likelihood they may, uh, they are have been created in a very artificial setting and we do not come across them very, uh, very commonly. So we're going to omit those for our purposes here and stop with the square planar uh, shape. So once again, I can't recommend enough going to the FET simulation and just playing around with those different molecules and looking at um, how they orient themselves. There's some really great things you can do with that simulation in terms of adding the lone pairs and visualizing them so you can see how they're affecting the shape. And you can also label the angles as well so you can see the angles on the uh, molecule itself. It's very helpful for helping you visualize how these shapes exist in three dimensions.